All right, it got, I said it got really quiet, so I guess that means I'm supposed to do something. Um, so good afternoon on behalf of the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, welcome and thank you for joining us. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dwayne Larrick. I'm Senior Vice Provost and Chief of Staff of the Provost Office. And it's my privilege to represent Provost Arden in our office at this event this afternoon. Today we come together in person and also via live stream to honor Dr. Holly Lynn Lee, Professor of Mathematics and Statistics Education in the College of Education, as one of only three finalists selected from a field of more than 115 candidates for the very prestigious 2022 Robert Foster Cherry Award for Great Teaching. In a few minutes, yeah. yes. In a few minutes, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Danowitz, Dean of the College of Education, will introduce Dr. Lee, who will present her lecture titled Data Moves and Discourse, Design Principles for Strengthening Statistics Education. But first, I'd like to say a few words about this prestigious award and Dr. Lee. The Robert Foster Cherry Award for Great Teaching was established in 1991 by Robert Foster Cherry and is awarded biennially, biennially by Baylor University in Waco, Texas. A native Texan, Mr. Cherry received his undergraduate education at Baylor and graduated from the Baylor School of Law also in 1932. It was with deep appreciation for the significant teachers who changed his life that Mr. Cherry established this award to recognize and reward professors who excel as outstanding communicators in the classroom and have a proven, distinguished, a proven record of distinguished scholarship and teach in ways that provide extraordinary, positive, inspiring, and long-lasting effects on students. The Cherry Award is designed not only to honor great teachers, but also, as we're trying to do today, stimulate discussion in the academy about the value of teaching and to encourage departments and institutions to really value their great teachers. NC State is really rich in exceptional faculty who are dedicated to great teaching and research. Dr. Lee is certainly a shining example of an educator whose achievements and impact in the field of math and statistics education are extraordinary, innovative, and far-reaching. We are really fortunate to have a well-respected, innovative educator and a world-class researcher such as Dr. Lee among our faculty. Her ability to inspire students, create useful knowledge, and pioneer innovative educational practices embodies the spirit of the award for great teaching that Robert Foster Cherry envisioned over 30 years ago. Provost Arden and our office are honored to support her candidacy for this award, and we truly believe that if chosen, Dr. Lee will provide a rich and rewarding educational experience for both students and peers at Baylor University. Before Dean Danowitz steps up to the stage, I'd like to just take a minute to thank the team of staff and faculty from the College of Education, the Office of Faculty Excellence, and the Office of the Provost for their efforts in helping put together the nomination and planning this event. Thanks again to all of you for taking time to share in this learning experience with one another, and I hope you'll be able to join us after the lecture for a reception with light refreshments outside in Stafford Commons. My note says, if weather permits, and I, I think we planned a gorgeous day for you. Um, so now I'll turn the podium over to Dean Danowitz for her introduction. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Dr. Larrick. And I too extend a warm welcome to all of you attending in person and those watching online. It's wonderful to see so many students, faculty, and staff from the College of Education and from across campus here to support our extraordinary colleague, Professor Lee. I'd especially like to welcome and acknowledge Dr. Sally Berenson, who retired from our college and university a few years ago and who chaired the search committee that hired Dr. Lee. Thank you for helping us get Holly Lynn here. As this award attests, Dr. Lee is an outstanding educator with a record of distinguished scholarship and a lifelong impact on students. She's a professor in our mathematics and statistics education program, one of the strongest of its kind in the nation. Our 12 faculty in the program 
are engaged in over $17.5 million in grant funded research projects. And they've graduated the fifth most recipients of doctoral degrees in mathematics education in the country. Our college has become a rich place for mathematics and statistics education because of our stellar faculty who conduct impacting research and provide mentoring and instruction that positions our students and our graduates for lifelong success. This program has become so strong in part because of Dr. Lee. I personally have seen her mentoring that she's provided to our junior faculty and I've witnessed how she lights up classrooms and inspires her students, both pre-service teachers and in-service veteran teachers who are pursuing their PhDs. Dr. Lee is the best of the very best. She spent her career helping others unleash their potential and improve the way that mathematics and statistics education is taught and understood. A former elementary, middle school, and high school mathematics teacher, Dr. Lee received her PhD in mathematics education from the University of Virginia and joined NC State in the year 2000. Over the past 21 years, she's helped change the way that mathematics teachers are prepared to use technology and she's designed innovative curricula that helps K-12 students understand and use data. Her own pedagogy is rooted in student experiences and research, while her enthusiasm for educational technology stems from her investment in more fully engaging students in their learning processes. Stu students describe Dr. Lee's class as a space where learners are encouraged to take ownership of course content and engage with concepts outside of the classroom, whether it's by creating lesson plans or pursuing their own scholarship. Dr. Lee has leveraged her own research and combines the art and science of teaching to impact thousands of students and educators across the entire educational spectrum. Her reach and impact is immeasurable. And I'm saying that to a mathematics and statistics <laughs> educator. She's received some 20 grants totaling over $14 million, much of which has helped support the development of mathematics curricula throughout the US and internationally. In fact, she's co-authored teacher education curricula used in more than 250 universities around the world. She has also engaged and taught online professional development courses that alone have attracted over 7,000 K-12 educators from 94 countries. Because of her exceptional research, advocacy, and contributions to the field and impact on other educators, Dr. Lee is one of the few educators whom the American Statistical Association has named a fellow. She has received dozens of other honors, including last year receiving the, the University of North Carolina System's highest teaching award, the Board of Governors Award for Excellence in Teaching. At NC State, she's a senior faculty fellow in our College of Education Friday Institute for Educational Innovation and she is a university faculty scholar. Dr. Lee has also assumed leadership roles that have shaped scholarship on mathematics education. She's a member of the editorial board of the Mathematical Thinking and Learning. And for an example, she's an associate editor for the Statistics Education Research Journal. Throughout her academic career, Dr. Lee has helped pre-service and in-service teachers infuse better technology tools, statistical content, and real world data into lessons to prepare students to be literate in statistics and data. Today, Professor Lee will speak on this very timely and salient topic about how we can strengthen data and statistics education and why it is imperative to do so. Please join me in welcoming my distinguished colleague, the Cherry Award finalist for the Great Teaching Award, Professor Holly Lynn Lee. Please come up to the podium, Holly Lynn. All right, let's test this. Thank you. 
Is the microphone, is this microphone on? Yes, okay, great. All right, thank you so much for those introductory words. I really appreciate it. And I so appreciate everybody that took time out of their day to join us here, um, both in person and um, online. Thank you so much. So um, you can read my title. I don't need to read it to you. But I'm really excited to be able to talk with you today about things that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, so we're going to get warmed up. Um, and I'd like you to get out your mobile device. And if you would open up a, you can either open up a web browser and go to menti.com or take a picture of this QR code. Um, I've got a question online for you to answer. I want you to think of a time that you used data to learn something or to make a decision. And I want you to briefly describe, don't write a paragraph, a couple words. All right, briefly describe what that phenomena or situation was where you used data to help you make a decision or maybe to learn something new. And while you are multitasking, I'm going to say my thank yous to Robert Foster Cherry, as uh, Duane was saying, for having that vision to create and establish this award, um, for all the hard work that's actually happened at Baylor University. Um, by the Cherry Committee and the faculty in the Curriculum and Instruction Department at Baylor, who are my hosts. I will be visiting there in about a week um, to teach classes um, for them and to uh, give um, another version of this talk um, there at Baylor and to get to meet and interact with people across campus. I would not be who I am today and where I am today without the support of my family and my friends. I've got three of them here with me, my family, my husband, Todd, my mother, and my brother. And thank you so incredibly much. And one good thing about masks is it hides my cry face, which is really <laughs> ugly. Okay, So we're going to get that out of the system. And um, thank you so much to my colleagues and my collaborators that I work every day with. The ideas that um, you're going to hear about today did not happen in isolation. They happened because I work with amazing people. And um, the intellectual capacity of us as a group is what actually leads to a lot of the, the design thinking that I do. Um, to all of my mentors and teachers in the past, um, Sally, thank you for hiring me uh, and, for, and for getting me a good head start here at NC State. I'm not a quality one, I <laughs> For um, all the faculty here at the Friday Institute and at NC State um, across different departments, and of course, um, as was mentioned, all of the people who have funded the funding agencies that have supported my research and my development over the years um, to make a lot of what I do possible. So let's go and look at some of our results. Later. All righty. And why is this not refreshing? Refresh. Here we go. Ah, so here are some, some ideas that we've gotten um, put in here. So let's see, you guys have used data to make decisions about buying things, buying a car, buying air flights, um, apartment shopping. Um, comparing products online. So lots of things related to, to buying, buying patio furniture. Hopefully it's on sale right now. Um, the, uh, when I was in my statistics class, I, I used data the most, all right? And so hopefully that person who put this about using data in your statistics class, I hope you're learning that you can use it in your everyday life as well and, and ways to think about that. Budgeting and spending your money, planning my schedule, Oh, looking at the Raleigh COVID numbers, um, thinking about nutrition lists um, on uh, values on a protein bar, um, grades on an exam and just determining what you might do with those grades instructionally to negotiate salary. Yeah, so some of these are related to our everyday life and some of these are related to our work situations. Our work is becoming more and more um, data intensive. Why is it doing that? There we go. Okay, so 
just a really quick kind of summary why we need to strengthen um, statistics education. A lot of that came out in your responses. All right, a lot of careers are becoming more and more data intensive and we need to prepare our students for those future careers and they're actually already here. All right. um, we need data literate citizens. All right, I want my neighbors and the folks in our society to be data literate so that we are making good decisions together for the good of the world. All right. um, the computational tools that we have access to have changed so dramatically um, since I got here in 2000. All right, so over 20 years, um, you know, we we have access to our uh, what's on our phone, what used to be sitting in a mainframe building. <laughs> um, our students need to know how to think with those tools, and I and many others would argue you don't do statistics and data without computational tools. Mm -hmm. We need to modernize school mathematics. Um, there's been a huge effort um, happening with organizations like the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, the American Statistical Association, and many organizations like Computer Science for All, um, efforts like Data Science for Everyone, where we're trying to build capacity to make school mathematics much more relevant than it needs to be. The march that we take kids to calculus is so 19th century. All right. It's time to get out of that model. There's many opportunities across the curriculum. It's not just in math class. So being able to integrate data and learn from data in literacy, in social studies, in our sciences, there's lots of opportunities there. So in 2015, I created the um, High Rise, which I call the hub for innovation and research and statistics education here at the Friday Institute. And I work with colleagues both here at the, at the FI as well as um, uh, across the United States. And we have lots of different projects. Many of the ideas you're going to hear today come from some of those um, projects. So I, in my heart, consider myself an educational designer. All right? When I think about creating lessons for students, whoever those learners might be in my classroom, I'm in design mode. I am, in, I am in an intellectual space where I am trying to orchestrate and to choreograph different opportunities for students to have access to different mathematical or statistical ideas. I'm thinking very carefully about the materials and the tools that I'm using. And I'm thinking very hard about the kinds of questions that I want to pose and the ways that I want the students to interact with one another. All of that creates purposeful design in education. And I claim that if you do that purposeful design, you create amazing learning opportunities for your students. And when I think carefully about what I do specifically related to the thing that I care most about in statistics education, there are two kind of critical aspects that bubble up to the top for me. They were in my title. Data moves and discourse, okay? So the idea of a data move is not unique to me. There's many people in statistics education that talk about um, the idea of a data move. They may not call it this. They may call it something different. There's lots of different languages used. But it's basically actions that one takes to produce data, to structure it, to represent it, to model it, to extend it, to enhance it. Things that we do with data to engender meaning from it. Okay. Discourse is being able to communicate with one another in our symbols, in our spoken word, in our written words, um, being able to share those ideas. And these two things coming together are really what I care a lot about and I use in my instructional design related to st um, statistics education. So we're going to do a little experience here. Um, if you're like me, you like to dine out and um, have a good meal with family and friends out at a nice restaurant where somebody else is in charge of cooking. Right? I probably do it a little more often than I should, um, sometimes out of necessity of a busy life, but I enjoy a good meal out. What I would like you to think about are places that you like to dine. All right? It could be a general geographic area that you like to go to because you know there's some good restaurants there to choose from. It could be a very specific restaurant or a genre of a restaurant a type of restaurant. Would anybody like to share with me places that they like to, um, to go and dine out? Say that again? Pizza. 
All right, you like to go out for pizza, okay? So looking for a good pizza joint, all right, is, a, is high priority. Any others? Downtown Durham. Downtown Durham, all right. What attracts you to downtown Durham? There's lots of options. You can walk places. Yeah, okay, so it's very walkable, and there's lots of options to choose from um, in, in downtown Durham. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about um, restaurants that are, um, that are in different cities, okay? Now, I'm getting ready to go to Waco, and, you know, I'm thinking they're going to take me out to eat. So uh, I'm hoping for some good uh, restaurant choices there. So I've, I've, I've actually used the tool that we're getting ready to, to look at to check out what's, what's happening down in Waco. But I did not develop this tool, but this is a, an example of a dashboard. And here's the um, URL you can go to. If you have a tablet, it's going to work great. If you have a phone, it's going to work, but it might be a little glitchy. Okay? Um, but I'm also going to be using it up here. Let's go to the next screen. Okay, so these were some researchers from Georgia Tech, and they were very interested in studying different characteristics of cities. And this page actually has a lot of their work on it, but we're going to focus on the first part, looking at restaurants. If you're on a phone, you're going to have to scroll down a little bit um, before you see the dashboard, the data dashboard that they've created here. Okay? So, each of the restaurants that they've located in the United States are represented by a dot on this map, pinned at the location, the geographic location that it, that it is at. And the dots have different colors. So these researchers gave the restaurants a score based on how unique they were or how much they were part of a franchise or a chain, okay? So your yellow restaurants are your unique restaurants. So the uh, restaurant that my grandfather had when I was growing up, Ye Old Coffee Pot, pretty unique, okay? It's gonna, it would have had a score of one. But a, re a restaurant, um, some of the pizza joints that you might go to, or a restaurant like um, Outback Steakhouse is, not, is gonna have a higher score because there are many, location, many um, instances of that across the United States. They were only looking at the 48 contiguous U.S. states, all right? And what we can do is perform some data moves in this dashboard to be able to start zooming in. And, and you can use your fingers on a, on a tablet or you can use the um, plus and minus to kind of zoom in and zoom out. So I'm going to start zooming out here to just take a look at the East Coast a little. And then I'm going to start zooming back in. And does anybody notice what is actually happening over on the right-hand si hand side while I am zooming in and out and scanning? There's some things being recomputed live while I'm scanning in. All right, there's our, there's our place, there's Raleigh-Durham. And I'm going to minimize that legend there. So here's the, the greater raleigh durham Cary area represented here. And I've done a data move to filter this data. All right, I have taken all of the cases that they have in their data set, and I have filtered it and created a subset of that data by using geography as a boundary, okay? And in this dashboard, it was recomputing some of the, um, the, the scores um, for the average chainness. So it takes all of the dots and it tells me that it has a little over 4,000 restaurants in this boundary, in this group that it, I've created here. And it's telling me the average chain score if I, I, if I collectively look at all of these restaurants together, okay? And if you notice, there is a good mix of yellows and pinks and the dark purple are your really, really high um, chain um, restaurants that are very popular across the United States. All right, so let's see. I heard about uh, downtown Durham. Um, does anybody like to go eat around here in downtown Raleigh? 
let's zoom in a little bit here where we've got the inner belt line. So we've got 440, so now I'm down to about 1,000 restaurants um, in my geographic view, and my change of score is going down, right? Where before it was like 1,400, now I'm down to 1,000, right? And, and I'm starting to see you know, a little bit more of the yellows. The yellows are a little hard to see. I, did, I don't like their color choices so much on this dashboard. Um, um, but there are still quite a few of those dark, dark purples, right? What do you notice about the geography of where you see some of the yellows and the pinks and purples? Anybody notice something about where those restaurants are located? Yellow, rural, rural areas are very yellow. Okay, rural areas tend, seem to be very, um, so you know, it's hard to be rural in, you know, I guess it was outside the belt line rural. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, along roads. Oh, yeah. So Hillsborough Street is that line that's coming right off the word Raleigh. All right, to the left of to the left of Raleigh. Okay. Um, but yes. So so Val, I totally agree. Whenever I was looking more, if you actually zoom out to the whole United States, the Midwest is either empty or yellow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. So I'm going to zoom in here so we can take a better look at Hillsborough Street and a little bit of like the warehouse district, downtown Raleigh, okay? And so, yeah, we're seeing this kind of um, tributary here with, with Hillsborough Street, and there's a good mix of yellows, purples, and pinks. So, you know, I'm kind of curious about these uh, purples here. All right, let's see. That one has, wow, that restaurant has a chain score of over 21,000. Does anybody think they know maybe what restaurants might have over 21,000 locations in the U.S.? Oh, Cracker Barrel, McDonald's, <laughs> Chick-fil-A, I think I heard. It's hard for me to hear up here. <laughs> All right, so I'm hearing a couple ideas. This is actually Subway. I used my Google searching skills to figure this out, okay? Uh, the researchers put a claim on here that they were not able to, um, they were not able to actually, uh, they don't have permission yet to put the names of the restaurants on their dashboard, all right? Um, but they're working on it. Um, but, you know, take a look particularly down here at the warehouse district, all right? Lots of unique restaurants. And I think that's highly related, and the researchers actually found this, um, and it's related to what Cindy shared earlier, that it's walkable. So in, in, in areas where you have, it's easy to walk, it's pedestrian friendly, you get a lot more of unique restaurants. And along highways and tributaries, you have a lot more of your chain restaurants that, are more dry, that you have to drive to get to, okay? So this was one way that they're able to kind of describe cities. Now, one of the things that, that I noticed is on this dashboard, there's a distribution down here. And this is a kind of a bad, um, uh, frequency graph that they've put in here, in my opinion, because um, they've got a large number of the restaurants clumped together um, right here. So this is a skewed distribution. What this is saying is that I have 315 out of the, what, 327 restaurants in this dashboard that really have kind of, kind of low chain scores. And then I have several that are, I have three of them here, three here that has about 7,000. There's two that, that have about maybe 12,000. I've got five that have up around 20,000, all right? What do those do to your average? They pull them way up, all right? And when you, when you have any kind of data that has a skewed distribution, those, those outliers are going to greatly affect your average. So if I click just these 527, and perhaps I start making this a little bit smaller, let's zoom in, my chain score starts to go down, okay? And it's not, let's see, let's do that again. Did not, I think they're having trouble with their dashboard, let's go. Come on. 
There we go. All right. Those 315 restaurants have a chain score of 59. All right. Much, much lower if I take out those outliers. So one thing that you think about with doing data moves is you have to think about on either end, are there, um, are there data points that are giving you a skewed kind of look at, um, at the data? So let's go back into this talk. All right. So what I do is teacher preparation, as was said um, in my introductions. And I work with both prospective teachers, undergraduates here at NC State, as well as practicing teachers that are um, out there in the field with, with uh, doing, doing what they need to do. And everything that I do in teacher preparation is grounded in research, whether it's research that I have done uh, myself with students and teachers or my knowledge of the literature that I learn from others. And so I have to really think about, so what is, well, how do I put these two critical ideas of data moves and discourse together when I'm dealing with statistics education? And there's things that I have to think about as far as the design of my lessons. The data that I want students to be engaged in has to be real, all right? Some of the textbooks that our students are using has real looking fake data in it. It's not really real, okay? It needs to be multivariate. We do not live in a univariate or bivariate world. We live in a multivariate world and our students are very well adept at reasoning that way if we give them the opportunity. The data has to be large. It doesn't have to be millions and millions and millions of cases like a data scientist might do, but it sure as heck needs to be bigger than what's in their textbook. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has to be sometimes messy. The context needs to be engaging with, for your learners. And I was hoping that restaurants might be engaging for our audience here tonight. The tools have to facilitate being able to do data moves. If those are important to me, we need to use tools that allow us to do those. And the tools need to facilitate visualizations and links among representations, as was being illustrated with that dashboard. The tasks need to have multiple entry points so that no matter where you are on your journey in thinking about data and statistics, that there is something accessible to you in that task. And the tasks provoke curiosity and deep engagement with the data. We didn't have time to really do deep engagement with that restaurant, but we got a little, we got, got, got a little fur, further into it. So what I'd like to talk to you about um, in, in my introduction, Dean Danowitz talked about some of the things that I have done. And I really want to shift that and, and talk about how those were design challenges for me and, and the folks that I work with and the, the opportunities for growth for myself. So I'm going to concentrate on like the last six or seven years of my career. But I just want to tell a one minute to two minute story about where things started for me at the beginning of my career at NC State. So there were two courses that played really, really critical roles for me that gave me a playground to do a lot of designing in. And that was EMS 480, Teaching Mathematics with Technology. Um, I started teaching that my first semester here. And then shortly thereafter, Karen Hollibrands joined me and we, we, we co-taught that class and we often had, she had a section, I had a section, we were often doing a lot of co-planning. So we were designing and imagining what, how we could make that class better. One of the things that we innovated in that course was thinking about how to create video cases that showed what kids could do with technology. And this is an example of kids using a data tool. And it was one of the first made available to teacher educators that other teachers could actually learn from. So we started bringing faculty in um, to NC State. They would come for a week and do summer institutes with us and learn about the different materials that we were um, developing and take them back to their universities to implement them in their um, courses. Then I had, so not then, but it was about 2002, 2003, um, I was working on um, a project where we were creating new courses for practicing teachers. So I started a course called Teaching and Learning Statistical Thinking that emerged from that project and it, it, it changed names several times kind of throughout this it, um, until finally in 2011, I worked with the statistics department and got it cross-listed. So it was, became the first course that was cross-listed between education and statistics. And that course, I did a lot of hands-on. We were, we were bringing ideas from uh, research projects back into the classroom. 
Um, they were using both technology and hands-on experiences. But because it, the course got cross-listed, it started attracting graduate students from across the university. So now in my course, I didn't just have math education majors. I had um, graduate students in statistics, in mathematics, in food science, in industrial engineering, in forestry, right? And they were there because they knew that in their career, they were gonna have to teach somebody some statistics. And so they came to this course to learn something about teaching and learning statistics. And it completely um, changed the kinds of conversations that we could have in the classroom. So in 2014, I was approached by Glenn Kleiman, who was then the director of the Friday Institute. And they had been doing these things called massive open online courses, MOOCs. Have you heard of a MOOC? Okay. But they were designing them specifically for educators. And he came to me and said, you know, we've been doing this, and I, I think it'd be a great idea if you developed one on teaching statistics. I was like, what? A, a MOOC? What? Um, I, I, that sounds really hard. Uh, no, I don't think so. And I kind of walked away from the conversation. But back in Poe Hall, we were having conversations about the need for online um, graduate programs and that we needed to reach more teachers that who, who couldn't just drive to campus to engage in our courses. So I got to thinking, I'm like, well, you know, I'm gonna go in this online world, I might as well do it. So, you know, go big or stay home. So I went big. And it was the most pedagogically challenging thing I have ever done, all right? Because I couldn't just take all the stuff that I had done in person and pick it up and transport it onto this online setting. That's not how learning works. That's not how teaching works, and I knew that. So I had to rip it all apart and start from scratch and think about, well, what do I want people to really learn from my course? What experiences do I want them to have? And how do I take advantage of the affordances of an online space and live within the constraints of an online space? And it was really, 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 really hard. <laughs> So I started working with my colleagues at the Friday Institute, and they had some design principles too. And I was like, oh, well, I kind of like this crew, you know? So they said, you know, when we do these MOOCs, we really need them for teachers. They need to be self-directed. They need to be flexible. They need to be personalized so the teachers can choose what they need, and they can engage when it makes sense to them. They need to be job connected. Teachers need to, to learn something that they can take back into their classroom tomorrow. They need to showcase multiple pers perspectives. It's not just you have an opportunity that it's not just a single instructor. You can bring together multiple voices for the educators to be the professionals that they are and to hear multiple perspectives and make their own decisions of what works in their context in their classrooms. And we need to find ways to, be peer, to promote peer supported learning. So I had to think about, well, then how do I apply my design principles within that framework? So with the data moves, I had to think about how do I engage teachers in data investigations online when I'm not standing right there next to them, all right? I needed tools that were so simple and easy to use that they did not need much instruction, all right? I needed data sets that were going to engage them, and I needed ways to introduce those contexts in a very quick and simple way so that they could get to, get to work on those problems. And I also knew that I needed to show teachers examples that kids can do this too. So I extended all of the things that I had learned about creating video cases to create a very large library. We created a very large library of, um, of videos of kids and teachers interacting in classrooms with using different data tools. So to accomplish the idea of discourse, again, the video cases are up there. When we didn't have live video footage, we used animated software and reconstructed conversations so that teachers could still see a representation of what happens in classrooms. And we brought together experts and we sat around the table, this, this picture up here at the, at the top right, and had conversations about different issues in statistics education. And then we chopped up that video into much smaller pieces so that 
um, teachers could, could hear like a five to 10 minute conversation about a particular issue and then be in the discussion forums kind of reacting and thinking about, about those. So I'll be told so far, um, the Friday Institute has many, many courses. I've been involved in four of them. Um, we've reached, our, I have new statistics for you, Marianne, um, all 50 states, over 100 countries. Um, and I, I tend to kind of underestimate um, our, our, uh, the number that we reach because we do know that we have teachers that come and enroll multiple times, so they get double counted. Um, they also forget their passwords and their logins, and so they, they create new accounts. Okay. Um, so we launched a new one this summer called Amplifying Statistics and Data Science um, in Classrooms, and we're doing a new model for that. It's open, it's on demand, it's never going to close. All right, so teachers can come in when they want to get um, what they need. So I had been making some headway and thinking about the practicing teachers, but I still was really passionate about prospective teachers, those undergraduates that are learning to, to be future math teachers. I really wasn't reaching them with my MOOCs that were designed for practicing teachers. So, I had to also think about how to do this in the reality of teacher preparation programs that look different across the US. There's no one model of how to prepare teachers. Nobody has a set of courses that all teachers at all universities take. Each university creates their own program. So the ESTEEM project, myself and my colleagues since 2016, um, have designed over 40 hours of multimedia material. We've packaged them in modules so that they can be picked and pulled and chosen um, strategically to fit into instructors' courses the way that they need them to be. So if an instructor in a program only has maybe one or two classes um, to help prepare secondary math teachers to teach, if they could give me two or three weeks, I got a module for that, all right? And so we started doing, again, professional development with the faculty. And we knew that we also needed to be innovative in the way that we got the materials in the hands of faculty. Because historically, really, mathematics teacher educators didn't have experiences doing data and statistics education either. So they're a little bit, when given uh, crunched for time, they're gonna leave that out of their classes. So I wanted to make it as easy as possible. So we give our materials away using a Creative Commons license. So teachers come into our portal here at NC State they download our materials, they suck it up into their learning management system, and then they can change it to fit within the course that they are teaching, all right? And one of the really exciting things in this project was we had an opportunity to work with the Concord Consortium to, to further some of the designs of an online free tool that they were designing. Um, and again, we started this grant in 2016 and we, our, our goal was to create this tool in a way that it would be more, um, more usable in middle school and high schools in science and mathematics. Those were our two kind of primary um, subject areas that we were going after there. And so we were able to help them design, like putting in things like box plots, being able to do linear regression models, um, being able to um, do a sampler and um, run probability models and collect data from probability experiments. So, I'm going to focus now, I'm going to give you two examples from some of the materials that we've developed to show a little bit more about how I integrate data moves and discourse. And we're going to do this in the context of roller coaster rides. So I want you to think about what makes a roller coaster ride thrilling or scary, right, depending on your perspective. Um, can anybody give me some ideas of the characteristics of a roller coaster that might make them thrilling or scary to you? Speed, okay? Feel the need for speed. <laughs> oh, the loop-de-loops, okay? And, and whether or not you get inverted. In, the safety record of the roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, we should care about that. <laughs> the height of the roller coaster, okay? Oh yeah, the falling, the, the, the kind of drop that you might have, all right? Um, so here's some images of some of my favorite roller coasters. Um, this, this one at the bottom here is an old wooden roller coaster called the Jackrabbit at um, Kennywood Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've been riding that since I've been a kid. Um, my, my mother will attest to the fact that I have drug her on roller coasters um, every chance I could get. 
um, and she couldn't wait till I was old enough to go on my, go on my own. Um, the, being able to go on the Incredible Hulk down at um, Universal Studios Orlando, and then we've got a picture of the Griffin close by um, in Busch Gardens, Williamsburg. And yes, my family likes to ride roller coasters, and here is us enjoying a ride on the Griffin. Okay, again, if you have a tablet, um, you can open up this data set with me. Um, it, it will open on a phone. It's, it's a little, um, CODEP was not designed to, to really run on a phone, all right? Doing data analysis on a phone, you know, kind of hard. Um, but I want you to think about, you know, how, what has changed in the design of roller coasters and the ride experiences over the years? So that's kind of our own opening prompt question here. And what I have is a data set that has all of the roller coasters that were in, in operation in the United States as of May 2020, right? And I have already filtered this data set to geographically just look at the roller coasters from parks around us. So we've got North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia showing right now um, on the screen. And in the table, I have the Griffin highlighted, all right? So I have the case of the Griffin roller coaster highlighted in my table. And you might notice that there is a dot that's colored blue on the graph that I pre-created, right? This is the distribution of the maximum height. Somebody earlier mentioned height, okay? That that's an aspect of roller coasters that can be thrilling or scary. So this is a multiple linked rep representation here and I've got maximum height. What, can, what do you notice about this distribution of maximum height? If you could say something about, well, most of the coasters seem to be, they seem to be what? Not high, okay? Most of the coasters are less than 100 feet tall. That's not that high, come on, you know? But there are a couple over there that, that look pretty high. Griffin is kind of on the higher scale. Um, but certainly they, didn't seem, they don't seem to be that high. They're kind of clustered um, down here. But I'm going to do a data move, and I'm going to add year opened. All right, so now I've taken my distribution, and I'm adding a second variable to this so that I can think about how the, how the maximum height might be changing as we go up in years. So the, in this particular um, subset of data, it's about 1965 is this roller coaster down here. And that's the Swamp Fox in Myrtle Beach. Okay. And so certainly it, it, it looks like older roller coasters tend to be pretty small. All right. And certainly it looks like the ones that are pretty tall are, uh, were built later. But could we make the claim that newer roller coasters are always going to be the, the higher ones? No, we can't, okay? Because if I highlighted those that were built between 2010 and 2020, I have a pretty wide uh, variability of those roller coasters. Some of them are quite, quite tiny, in, in my view and others are quite tall, okay? Um, so I can think about, somebody talked about those loop-de-loops, all right? The inversions, you may not have used that word, I used that word. Um, getting turned upside down. So I'm gonna recolor my icons on whether or not the roller coaster inverts you, all right? This is similar to what was going on in that r restaurant dashboard, okay? The icons, the restaurants were colored based on their chain score, all right? So I now have how many variables that I'm looking at? Three, I've got three variables, okay? Was that so hard to look at three variables? Not really, okay? So what can someone tell me about where you see the purple coasters? Those are the ones that are, yes, you get inverted. And where you see the orange coasters? in this distribution, in this scatter plot. Where are the purple ones? They're, they're, kind, they're kind of in the middle, okay? So they're kind of in the middle there. So they're, they're, 
it just seems like they, they all have kind of similar heights there. So I'm going to I'm going to click on the yes so all of those get highlighted for me. And I'm going to do another data move that I think might help me to examine the differences of whether coasters are inverted. So I'm going to play, replace gear opened with inversions. So now I have two different dot plots and they're separated by whether the coasters are inverted or not. So I can now see that all of those coasters that weren't very tall, they don't invert you. Okay. You probably need some height on a roller coaster to actually get the speed to actually safely invert you, going back to that safety record. Um, I can add in things like a box plot. I can show whether there are outliers. I can add in a line representing the average or the mean. And it does indeed look like that coasters that are inverted in general are taller than those that are not. Okay? There's kind of a separation there in that data. And it's these outliers here on the bottom that are really kind of making the, the ones that are not inverted um, make this distribution look so skewed. So I'm curious, now that we've seen this pattern, I want to add back in, so I want to zoom out and take a look at all the coasters. I'm going to add back in all those coasters across the United States. And I want to see if the, the trend that I'm seeing it stays the same because I'm going from a sample back to my population. All right. Hmm. It does still seem to be true that those that do not invert you tend to be a lot shorter. Okay. But the distribution of those that are inverted has some different features in it that were not present before. All right. There are outliers, all right? There's a lot more that are shorter and a lot more that are taller that we didn't see when we just looked at the coasters built around us. Okay, so let's go back to here. And now let's think about a focus on discourse about what kids do when they play with roller coaster data, okay? As I said, we've collected hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a video of kids engaging in different tasks. And in this video, we've got two seventh graders. I'm going to show you about a two to two and a half minute clip. Okay? And I want you to pay attention to the way that they're using the data tool. And I want you to think about the, the things that they're talking about. And I actually am, am, am kind of crouched down next to them asking them some questions. Okay? Whoops, excuse me. Cannot use my clicker to start a video. And then scroll this over, then you can get to the top speed. Ah, Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah. No. There you go. That's fancy. Fancy, fancy. Oh, wow. So what, what is, kind of graph is that? It looks like a spaceship. It looks like a spaceship? Yep. It's like an aurora. <laughs> Yeah, it does kind of look right more. You know what that officially is called a scatter, a, a scatter plot. Ah. All right. You'll, you'll learn more about those a little bit later. All right. But yeah. officially, it's where you're looking at two different variables at the same time. Yeah. So what does that graph tell you? It tells us the top speed and the drop. Let's and see. It's top speed seems to be 100. Top speed is 120 and the drop is 400 feet. I, uh, uh, Who is that? Ohio. Um, no, it's in Ohio. In Ohio. The drop is actually 420. Top, top thrill dragster, Cedar Point. I remember. Um, that's the. I'm pretty sure that's the highest roller coaster in the world. Oh, wow. Um, I wonder hmm. what its height is. The highest roller coaster. Alright, if we can just grab hold of that teeny little scroll so, bar. So, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a... Um, I'm going to throw a twist into your graph and see what, yeah. see if you guys can make sense of this, okay? Yeah. So I want you to grab wood versus steel. So that was, I think it's type. Here we go. Grab type. Put it in the middle of your graph. 
Yep. Oh. What did it do? That's pretty cool. It told us, it's telling us right now which parts are wooden and which coasters are steel. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we can. Uh, just happened. I think I killed it. Yeah, click on that and remove it. Okay. There we go. Take a look at that and see in a little bit if you could tell the class anything that you might notice that's interesting. Um, a lot of the wooden ones are slower and have a shorter drop, and the vastest ones are steel. Yeah, you're the one that yeah, all How about type versus max height? Mm -hmm. They suggested a data move. So they had done all the data moves up to that point. They had been looking at drop. They added top speed. That was their choice. I didn't even tell them where to put it on the graph. They, they found the other axis and put it on the other axis. Okay? They had never seen a scatter plot before. That was kind of obvious. All right? um, and when I asked them what they were seeing, they really couldn't tell me anything about the trend. All right? They were telling me the variables. Well, it's telling you the drop in the top speed. But then they got attracted to a special case. And we know from a lot of research that Special cases in data can help students make sense of the aggregate. So at first, teachers might be disappointed that, well, they're only looking at that one dot, right? But that's a natural tendency. It's a thing to capitalize on. It's the sense making that the students are doing. And so as a teacher, you need to know that that's not a bad thing. And so in our, our discussions around this video, teachers start picking up on that. And there it's like, oh, wow, it actually led to some interesting thinking, OK? And the teacher suggests, I, I wasn't too happy about the fact that they weren't noticing any trends. So I, instead of explaining what I wanted them to see, I made the graph more complex. I added a third variable so that it could contextualize something about those roller coasters for the students. And it worked, because the student looked at this and said, Oh, the wooden ones, which are in pink, are slower and have a shorter drop. They're now able to locate those pink ones, and they're making a statement coordinating two variables. All right? And then he also adds on that it is the fastest ones that are the steel, the greens that are up there in that top corner. Okay? That happened because of a data move and because of interactions with the teacher. So when we look at some of the research that my colleagues and I have done in both the online environments as well as the materials that we use for, with prospective teachers, we really were trying to look at, well, what design elements that we're using seem to really trigger reflection on teachers' parts that lead to growth in their understanding about how to teach statistics. First of all, the data investigations matter a lot. All right. Most teachers in their own schooling did not have opportunities to do this before. So when they get the opportunity to explore data in ways that they have never experienced before, their eyes get lit up and they start seeing the possibilities. The classroom-based videos make a huge, huge difference because they can imagine what, they don't just have to imagine what happens, they can actually see some, some instances of what happens and not all the videos that we show them are amazing things happening, all right? Because we can learn from problematic things that happen, problematic language that is used, for example. Okay? They learn around frameworks, all right? Um, any of us that do research in education, we love our frameworks, all right? This one's not a Venn diagram. Um, my husband always makes fun of me that uh, educators like to do, do everything in a Venn diagram. Um, but you know, in this particular framework, it really talks about how um, we need to think about students' statistical thinking in a cycle of an investigation, being able to pose questions, collect your data, make sense of your data, analyze your data, and that the, these concentric circles around that talk about the growth and levels of understanding that teachers and that students develop as they get more and more experience in data and statistics. It doesn't happen with one lesson or in one grade. And they absolutely learn a lot from those expert panel discussions. Um, for, uh, 
Practicing teachers really learn a lot from all of the different discussions that happen among the experts. Pre-service teachers or prospective teachers really learn a lot more whenever they're listening to conversations about specific tasks. When, when the experts are talking about lessons that they've done in their classrooms or tools that they've used and strategies that they've done, the practicing teachers learn a lot more from that than they do listening to different issues and discussions around issues. So my current design challenge that I have with my, with my colleagues is how do I make statistics and data science central um, in the secondary math classroom by meeting teachers where they are? So in comes our latest grant, INSTEP, can you tell I like nice acronyms? Um, and this is funded by the National Science Foundation with my uh, co-PIs, Jima Majika and Alex Dreyer um, at the Friday Institute and my colleagues at RTI International. And we're trying to design a learning platform built on a framework, surprise, surprise, of seven dimensions of teaching statistics and data science that we know from literature really make good learning environments. The ideas of data moves certainly come up in thinking about data and technology. And up here at the top about the practices of doing things with data and statistics. The ideas around discourse really come to the fore in this red area about argumentation. Discourse, we want to promote discourse in all of our classrooms, but discourse with data has a slightly different flavor because there might be instances when two or three groups of students are using the same data set and come up with different claims. So how do you handle that as a teacher? How do you orchestrate that discussion and push them to kind of be thinking about what is it that they're seeing and what's, the, what's leading to a particular claim and what evidence do they have to back that up? And of course, we're keeping data investigations in that experience and being able to learn about pedagogy. We're organizing these around modules related to the different dimensions. Um, and we're trying to create ideas around personalizations and ways that teachers can collaborate online together. So in summary, when you're doing different design work, you need to think about what is principled to you and how you are going to approach every different problem that you have, um, whether it's in education or in your daily life. So in our audience today, whether you want to learn statistics and data science, whether you want to teach statistics and data science, whether you want to design learning environments, whether they're online or in person, or maybe you want to just tackle a problem in your work or your life. I'm hoping that you heard something today that you could consider how you could do this and what you could or should consider. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I think, I know we were running a little late when we started, but if there are um, any questions, I'm, I'm happy to entertain them. Not to entertain you, but to entertain the questions. <laughs> Yes. Can we find some of these design principles that you've published? Very good question. So yes, I, um, I, I can put together a, uh, a reference list for you of all the different things that, that we've talked about. So one paper that came out where we talked about design principles, um, Karen Hallbrands and I just published that last year, where we looked at the, um, the MOOCs and thinking about um, um, how we applied the different design elements in the MOOCs um, based on different design principles. We've got a book chapter coming out that, that's very much focused on the esteem project and the, um, the undergraduate materials that we've developed and we really talk about those design principles there as well. So I'd be happy to send this to you, Sally. Huh? I'll get you that list tomorrow, dear. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. like what, that's a you know, thing we do in teaching is use non-examples to right. kind of sharpen into focus what's happening. Yeah. And so it's kind of cool to think about outliers in that way. Right. I really appreciate that. And then the other thing is, you know, a linear graph is kind of boring, right? And then when you put two different things in there and it became more complex, yeah. it actually was more engaging. And I think that's, you know, 
counterintuitive to this idea that we need to start super simple and build. Right. Um, you have to create something interesting. Right. Um, and that third dimension really, again, kind of yeah. engaged the kids. Right. Good. I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> and I hope you can take that back as far as thinking about um, your, your own instruction and the things that you design. I'm smiling at you, by the way. Oh. <laughs> I'm smiling with my eyes and my mouth. You just can't see it. Yes. 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 Having that, that's why that one of my principles is you have to use multivariate data because adding in different variables really enhances their understanding of the context and being able to make sense of the data itself. Yeah. What was your most joyful time when you're working with students or teachers? Oh, wow. Most joyful time. Um, hmm. So I really have been, so first of all, I, I guess I get different joys whenever I'm working with students and whether I'm working with teachers. So working with the students, I mean, any time that I get to actually be in a classroom where they're engaging with data, and we just have so much fun together, and it really does um, create a lot, of, a, a lot of joy. So I can't think of, of any particular lesson, but um, just, those, just those opportunities where they are digging into the data and making sense of it just bring a lot of joy to me. Um, as far as thinking about um, my work with teachers, um, I, I have experiences that are both in person and online, and I'm, I'm gonna use an online um, example for this one. Um, it was teachers reflecting actually on um, a, a, one of those expert panels and a teacher like, started this thread where they were like, oh my gosh, I am so guilty of doing exactly what those experts said we should not do in the classroom. You know? And this teacher just like opened herself up on this discussion forum and there were probably 30 or 40 teachers that jumped into that discussion and were like having confession. All right. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, that is what I do. So it's kind of interesting that I thought of that as joyful, but it was, it was pleasurable in the sense that the, it was cathartic for these teachers to say, you know what, and it's okay, and we're going to get better. You know? And so that, that, that was a really joyful experience. And it happened online. I don't even know who those teachers are in, in real life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How do you hold yourself back in those moments? Because they're in that video when the student goes, oh yeah, that's the highest roller coaster. How did you hold yourself back from not pushing him to look at that one point? Because he had the data in front of him and could have proved it. Right. So how did you hold yourself back from that and keep on track? Was it just love? Just love and numbers? Uh, yeah, and I guess because I know that the more that the students struggle on their own to make sense of things, um, and, and you may or may not notice that I, I walked away from the students and then, and then I kind of couldn't hold myself back and I went back to actually suggest another data move, all right? And so, um, so there was a little bit of both of those things going on in that moment. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that you, you have to have faith that students can dig in together, but you also have to listen carefully to see where the conversation is going. But when I sat back and I listened to that video, those students did not get an immediate opportunity to pursue the idea of height because I came back and intervened. So there was a lost learning opportunity that happened on their part because they could have brought in that variable of height because they had found interest in them. But what I brought in was type. Okay. And so, um, and I didn't, I didn't necessarily know that, know that at the, in, the, in the, that exact moment. It was later in watching that video that I was like, oh yeah, you know, if I would have let them go, they probably would have used a different variable. So that's where the other self coaching can love right away, too, allowing students to make those moves. Yes. But it's just allowing that moment, like you said. Right. Right, right. And, you know, teaching, teaching with data can be scary, all right, because you, you, you do have to kind of say that you're going to be a learner along with them, and you might not always, you, you know, especially if you're using a large multivariate data set, you can't, you can't know every kind of relationship and trend that's going to show up in that, in that data set. And so you're there thinking really hard in the moment um, to be able to, to think about what that next um, question might be. And that, that can be scary. 
or thrilling? <laughs> well, I think we've got some lemonade and cookies downstairs um, outside, so I don't want to keep us to that. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, we don't have cookies and lemonade. You heard nothing. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, in Lincoln Center, after great performances in New York, <laughs> they give flowers. And in Stockholm, in the concert hall, after great science, they give flowers <laughs> to Nobel laureates. And you combine science and art as a wonderful teaching example. Congratulations <laughs> from your colleagues and students. Thank you. Thank you so much to the Academy. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay, now you can have lemonade and cookies. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>